So this is our work today. I think you guys can see my notes here with this topic B. So it says that we're now collecting and processing the accounting data of an entity. So the processing of the accounting data, it, which it includes the accounting cycles. So in the accounting cycles there, we've got the transaction that has to take place. So they'll tell you like put your limited what so and so and so. That's, that's actually your, your, your the example that I'm just trying to phrase out. So that, that will be that kind of a transaction that will be taking place. And then obviously when there's a transaction, the next step will be to um, identify what are the source documents based on the transaction that has been given. So whether it's a credit note, a debit note, check count of us and so forth, right? And then we need to record the transactions in the journals. And then when, after we are done with recording all the transactions in the journals, <laughs> sorry, uh, then we're going to pose those columns of the journals to the ledger accounts. And then we report towards our financial statements. I think I gave you a brief overview with regards to the financial statements. And we analyze and interpret those financial statements. And then we've got the upper level people who make the decisions. Those are the management. All right, let's have a look at uh, the books of our first entry here. So looking at the importance of the journal entries arising because the recording of transactions in the ledger account would make it use, uh, would make it an easy or bulky or unmanageable. So what they're saying here is if you can look at our let me just go back at our accounting cycle. When you are given a transaction, you can't just simply move on by doing the ledger accounts because you may be given or the company might be dealing with a lot of transactions. Hence why you have to identify the transaction that has taken place with the documents. And then your first start will be with the journals. As soon as you do the journals, and the reason why we do the journals first is because we avoid, we avoid this, uh, the ledger accounts to be quite bulky. But when you're doing the journals, uh, creating those columns like your bank, your analysis, your trade and other receivables control the total, it's what you're going to put as your open balance under that specific T accounts. Okay, so that's why you, your, your journals are so important before you can do the, the, the ledger accounts. Right, looking at the types of journals that we have and its functions along with the source documents. We've got the CRJ, which is simply your cash receipts journal. We've got the CPJ, which is your cash payments journal. And they all records the all, they all records all cash in and out transactions for the company. All right. Meaning that when we receive the money, it will go through to our CRJ. When we make payments, it will go through to our CPJ. That's when we are taking the money out of the business. And when we're receiving it, it means that the money is actually coming in the firm. Looking at your PJ and the PRJ, that's your purchases journal and its own purchases returns journal, which records all the credit purchases and all the returns of the transaction. So this is how this is how it goes here. So when you whenever you purchase goods on credit, you're going to record that transaction under your purchases journal. Say that for instance, maybe the goods has some certain defects on it. It is damaged or it has expired and all of those. And obviously you're going to uh, record that under the purchases returns you know because you are retaining the goods that is no longer suitable for use then we've got the sales journal and the sales returns journals which it all records the credit sales and the returns same applies when you sell goods on credit remember that's actually the opposite of your purchases journal when you sell goods on credit you need to record that under your sales journal However, if the client is actually complaining that the same reasons the good has expired or some certain defects on it, obviously they're going to return their goods back to our firm as when you're going to record them under the sales returns channel. So the confusion here for the students is uh, they sometimes don't understand the relationship, the relationship between them as the company and the clients. So usually the questions will lead you to tell Putty Limited and so on and so on so financials are ending on this date. You need to regard Putty as you, as the firm, meaning that the relationship that you have with your future clients, they are truly going to be your clients. So when you do the financial statements, you're going to do the financial statement based on Putty Limited. That is actually you. It can be Alma Trader, it can be Johnson & Johnson, you name them. Right, moving on further, we're we having the general journal, which records any transaction that does not fit 
in the above mentioned journal, meaning that any transaction that has been given to you that doesn't fit in your CRJ, CPJ, PJ, PRJ, SJ, and SR, SRJ, you have to put that under your general journal. Right. So if you identify any transaction that doesn't go in any of those journals there, then that means it goes through to your general journal. But before I go further, any questions? Okay. So I was saying that I Hi, get Christian, a bit confused go to as to what transactions actually go there because sometimes you think you think it's supposed to go uh, on the in the general journal, then it goes to to the cash receipt yes. or something like that. So how do we know that this one is going okay. there, and not there? Like maybe for water and electricity bill, or maybe for advertising. We know that this one is supposed to go to the cash payment journal, not to the general journal. How do we know? All right, thank you very much. That's a very important, good question. How do you identify as to which transaction goes to, to your CRJ and the CPJ? Right, as I've already mentioned, because I can see, I assume you guys can see my notes in here. Look at what I'm highlighting here. All right, uh, your CRJ and CPJ identification of those kind of transactions you, you need to look at, first and foremost, is going to be cash or check or EFT, okay? And then the second thing, or well, the second step that you have to look at is who is paying who? If a client is paying you, it means that your business bank account is going to receive the money. Let's say, for instance, it's me, Putin Limited. Uh, it says, Cristel is actually one of my clients, and then Cristel is actually buying goods for me by cash. Or he's actually, sorry, she's actually paying by the EFT, or you are paying by check. So me, as the business owner, put a limited, I'm going to put that under my CRJ simply because you're buying goods for cash, or it's a service rendered for cash, check, or EFT, meaning that I am receiving the money. That's why it says the cash receipts general. I hope that makes, makes sense. Let me move on to the uh, CPJ, which is actually the exact, the quite exact opposite of the CRJ. For instance, it's me and Cristel again. It's Putin Limited, it's Cristel. You understand? So Putin Limited is actually buying goods from Cristel by cash, EFT, or check. So what's going to happen is in my business as Putin Limited, I'm going to record that under the CPJ simply because I'm paying the money out to Cristel. Yes. Is it making sense, Christelle? Yes, that's okay. All right, thank you very much for that. I'm gonna move on to purchases journal and PRJ. Let's say, uh, I'm just gonna give you an example with regards to that. Okay, this is how it happens now. Um, Christelle is my client again. Christelle is actually buying goods from me on credit this time around. You're no longer buying with cash, right? So the mere fact that you're actually buying goods from me by credit, it means that it's going to be it's going to fall under the purchases journal. Every goods that are bought by credit falls under your purchases journal. Okay. All right. For some reason, Cristel is actually not happy about the goods that she has bought from me. You understand? Maybe they expired or they had certain defects on that. You are retaining the goods through to me. I'm going to open the the cash book analysis which is called the purchases returns journal simply because the goods have been or some of the goods have been defected and then you are returning back them, them future. so i have to actually show that Cristel is one of my clients we're not happy about some of the goods because we see that when when you go to let's say you go to pick and pay you buy your tin fish on the shelves and you find out that maybe they, exp they had a defect on that one you understand so what's going to happen? You take it back, but they will tell you, give us the proof of purchase. That's your receipt to prove that you have bought it from pick and pay. So what's going to do is, what they're going to do is, they're going to take it through to the credit department and the credit department will just record it that as the purchases returns journal. So whatever the narration that they might give, it might be the goods have been defected or the good has been expired. Okay, so the what, purchase- Can I move the, on now? The, the purchase journal, I thought it was when the company, let's say you are the you the company, let's say you are the company and like you are buying goods that maybe you intend to sell. I thought that was when the 
the chase journal was coming into play. There would still be applicable. Remember when the companies are buying goods, but they have to buy that goods on credit, right? Yes. So the buying is actually not that much of a factor. The factor is whether it's a cash or it's a credit. If me put in limited, if me put in limited, I buy from let's say cash and carry, or I buy from, I don't know what can I say, or Johnson and Johnson, and maybe whatever the products that are bought from Johnson and Johnson on credit, they've got a defect and stuff like that. I think you're right. It's just that maybe you just need to know the relationship between who is the supplier and who is the client. Exactly. So when I buy goods from Johnson & Johnson and some of the goods are defected, when I return them back, sorry, when I buy them on credit, that's when I'm going to open that the purchases journal there. But when okay. I return them, obviously it's going to be under the purchases returns journal. So it depends that's on who is selling to me or who is buying to me. Yes, that's clear. Okay. So an example with regards to your sales journal and the sales returns journal. So I think maybe I made a mistake by that one. Yeah. On the sales, when, when you're buying goods, when you're selling goods on credit, that is when you're going to actually record those transactions under your sales channel. And then when the client returns the goods that they bought on credit, then you're going to record that under your sales returns channel. Does it make sense, Crystal? Yes, that's clear. That's okay. It's crystal. Okay. No, yes. that, that's fine. So, all right, no, no problem. Um, the general general, as I've mentioned, maybe let's say they bought an equipment for whatever the reasons, and it doesn't fit under your CRJ or CPJ, PJ, PRJ, SJ or SRJ, then obviously you might record that under your general channel. But we'd look at what kind of transactions do they actually go in there. Okay, so this could be one of your multiple choice questions. You may find it in the exam or you may find it in your assignments. Basically, it will be in, it can be part of your assignments. I'm sure you guys have came across this kind of uh, questions under your journals or the cash book journals. Right, let's have a look at the source documents for the journals that it would be as follows. The nice part about this whole thing is that when you go live in terms of work, you will be able to deal with this. When you do your audit, you'll be able to request from your clients about their source documents and all of those. Right, so but that's fine. Let's move on now to the source documents for the journals. Uh, it would be as follows, CRJ. So the source document is the cash register or the duplicate of the receipts. And the cash payments journal, we're looking at the count, check counter foils and the debit notes. Purchases journal, we're going to look at the original invoices. And the purchases returns journal, we're looking at original credit invoices. Sales journals, we're looking at the duplicate of the sales invoices. And the sales returns journal, we're going to look at the original credit note. But here's the thing, guys. I just put some of the few examples in here. It doesn't mean that they are all completed here. So you still require to go through your study guide and have a look at that. And I assume you guys are actually not using the textbook at this point in time. Right, trial balance, I think I've discussed this with you on Saturday. You remember when you're done with your journals and then your ledger accounts, and then you need to balance your, 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 your figures towards your trial balance. You need to take what belongs to the debit to the debit side and what belongs to the credit side to actually the credit side. So if it doesn't balance, so obviously the list that you have prepared to determine errors that might, there might be an errors in the list that you have determined. So that means that you need to go back and recheck your work so that there would be your balance would be equal to so your, your debit balance will be equal to your credit balances settlements discount we're looking at the granted part so it says that the discount granted are often are often offered to the debtors to encourage them for quick settlements that are within their stated credit terms right uh, let's say you bought your car on a high purchase automatically you're going to become the debtor to walk to whoever they bank it might be with a financial institution it is so what they do is regularly they send you a statement that shows the descriptions of your financial terms so they're going to show you how much will be your original high purchase cost they're going to show you how much of the interest did they charge you along with its rate they're going to show you your the cost of your motor plans and all of those things and they're going to show you, they're going to send you what's called the settlement letter. So what happened in the settlement letter is, it's a figure that allows you to actually settle the car without paying 
the interest that there is actually remaining on the entire side of the contract, meaning that the original cost, original cost, it will be, it will, it's going to, they're going to deduct the, the interest amount that has been charged, the amount for the maintenance plan or the motor plan and all of those, and then it will come as a settlement fee for you. So usually when they send you that kind of a letter, they will tell you that we give you this letter, the, it's probably valid for about 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours. So after a 72 hour period, it might change down. So if you are, depending on the rate that you take, if you're taking the fixed interest rate, meaning that whenever we are heated by the, insur the inflation, you're not going to be affected. So those that are actually on the linked interest rate, obviously when there are changes with regards to inflation factor, obviously the, the installment is either going to go up or it's going to, sorry, the settlement amount is going is to go up or it's going to go down along with your installments. Right, let's have a look at the settlement discount received. So you are the, you are the, you are the creditor here. So the creditors are often encouraged to make quick settlements by granting settlements by their their credit terms. So it's either way. In most cases, you can see that it's, it all includes the debtors or it includes the creditors. Okay. So usually the creditors will always issue all the settlement throughout your debtors, so that the debtors can actually pay their their settlements in time. So, but here's the thing. Remember, we're not doing only accounting in here. If you're going to measure with auditing, you need to be aware of this whole things because you are going to do what's called the internal controls, your substantive procedures and stuff like that. So it's important for you to actually look at the entire set of your, uh, your accounting cycle so that you'll be able to know how to establish the transaction, how do you audit the transaction, what are the source documents required, what are the dates, who is actually engaged in this whole process, what are the powers, you understand? The person appointed for that kind of position, are they relevant? Do they qualify to actually can do that kind of, of the job? So that's actually in regards to your auditing. I don't think you have to worry about it now. Maybe you might worry about second year when you do it. That value added tax, we are bringing SARS into board here. It says that it is levied at every point in the production and the distribution channel paid over to SARS, preferably in, in every two months uh, period and it is currently levied at 15%. Uh, I think two years ago, it was actually 14% and they now increased it to 15%. Right, when it comes to that, you need to understand for you to actually can charge clients that you need to be registered for that. You cannot just say, oh, I've got a business, then my clients have to pay that. You can't charge people that if you are actually not registered for that. It's not within the law, it's illegal. Right, let me move on to the categories. The IS follows, we've got output VAT, which is based on the sale of goods and services, and then we've got the input VAT, which is based on the purchases of goods and services. So, but here's the thing. On this cash book analysis that we have, usually they've got a VAT column. We know our sales journal, they've got an output VAT, and the purchases journal, they've got an input VAT. And the reason for that is because sales is attracted to an income. That's why you're charging out an output VAT, and the creditors are more um, associated with an input because they are actually, we are the people that we owe them the money at the end of the day. So you will see when we do the questions next week, we're going to have the sale, the, the cash payments general, the cash payments general, and they both have input in the red output but we'll see that when we cross the, the, the bridges output input which one goes to the debit which one goes to the credit the output goes to the credit and the input goes to through to the debit all right and it goes through to the credit simply because an output represented income or the liability and that one goes through to the debit because it represented expense which is an input that Okay, so in clear? the case, yes, it is. So in the case where the output is is um, is greater than input, it means that the balance will go to yes. to the credit. Is that correct? To the liabilities? It's gonna go through to the credit. It means that you owe SARS. If your output is greater okay. than your input, it means that 
you have to, it means that the vendor owes out. And if your debit is greater than your credit, it means that SARS has to refund you them. All right, let's look at the registration process in regards to the VAT. They say that it is measured by voluntary or compulsory, depending on how much the vendor make in a monthly period. However, the VAT cannot be attached on the product or service if the entity is actually not registered for VAT. I think uh, in regards to the registration, it's going to be depending on the vendor. So the vendor is actually, the, it's, it's actually named if the business is registered for VAT. So they would call you a vendor. But the reason why it cannot be attached to your product or service if the entity is actually not registered for VAT is because it's exactly what I just said. You cannot charge your client VAT if you are actually not registered for VAT. It's as easy as that. It means that you're going to be responsible to pay your company tax only. But let's look at the accounting basis. The two types for basis of basis for the calculations of the VAT liabilities. If the invoices basis, so this one you're going to actually recognize the charge VAT only if, I think I was supposed to say invoices are issued. When the invoices are issued is when you can recognize your VAT, charge the VAT. So the payment basis says that when the payment are received, that's when you can only recognize or pay or charge your VAT. If uh, you guys don't have a questions, I've got a question for you. I'm going to type it here. I think you guys will be able to see it. Okay, so you've got Equity Limited. And uh, Pooty has purchased. Value of a thousand rent. Uh, from Vodacom on the first of Jan twenty twenty two on credit. Vodacom is not registered for that. Uh, look at me, same VR. I think it's all come out, sorry. All right, please explain. Calculate the above transaction is going to be formed. Anyone quickly, please help me here. Please explain the bad implication and calculate how the above transaction is going to be performed. Can we do this? Just a moment for me. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you see that now? I'm just trying to make it bigger for you. So this is your question. You're now faced up with a live scenario question. All right, please help me out here. Since well, you guys are understanding, you've got an understanding of this, um, uh, the value implications. Can somebody just help me on how am I going to record the implications of that? Crystal, please go ahead. Okay. Um, Alright, let me just. If uh, product one is not registered for that. Huh? 
All right, what are the VET implications here? No VET. I will say uh, no VET. None. Sorry, I'm struggling to hear you. No VET. There is no VET implication since Vodacom is not registered. Uh, no VET to be charged because Vodacom is not a VAT vendor. Sorry. What's going on now? Crystal? Hello? Yes? Is that, like that? Is that your answer? Yes. All right. So the recording part. We will look at the recording. Oh, the transaction. All right. How are you going to record this? Uh, in the books of first entry, or let me just say in the cash books, in the subsidiary books. Uh, this transaction will only be recorded under the PJ because the goods are bought on print. Right. And the how part would be how is it going to be recorded? You're going to have the column for the amount, then you're going to have the column for the creditors. Who are the creditors? Vodacom. The amount. 500,000 along with the creditors amount will be the same as 500,000 rent and then do not forget to put your rent values aside just to show you are dealing with the figures not the notes so this is as easy as it's going to be recorded all right we've recognized that Vodacom is actually not a vet vendor number one the recording part okay the vet implications no VAT to be charged and simply because Vodacom is actually not a VAT vendor. The recording of the transactions in the subsidiary book, the transaction will only be recorded under the purchases journal because the goods are bought in credit. How is it going to be recorded? So this is your journal, basically. I just couldn't draft the, the proper one now because of time. So the supplier is Vodacom. How much did the goods worth? 500,000 rent, which is the amount, and the creditors will have an amount of 500,000 rand. Then your VAT, let's look at the implications now here. Uh, that will be a no because you can't charge people that if you're not. Does it make sense though? Does it make sense? Yes. Yes. It yes. does make sense, right? Yes, okay. Now I just need to give you a clarity of uh, the VAT implications and just to pick up one of the subsidiary journals in there, but we'll do mostly when we meet on Saturday. Okay. I'm just going to make a short question with regards to our subsidiary journals and then we'll move on to the, uh, what do you call it, learning unit six and learning unit seven. Okay. Uh, while I'm still searching my learning unit seven, I'm going to give you five minutes break and then we'll be back at uh, 1854. All right, let's move on to learning unit six, which deals with uh, the adjustments. 
So our introductions would include the steps to be followed in these adjustments. Number one, you need to identify the steps in the adjustments, meaning that when you're giving a transaction, you need to adjust, uh, identify whether that transaction is actually required to be adjusted or not. So you need to identify the account. That's the first step that you must actually do. And the second one, you're going to look at the effects of the accounts to be affected and what are the balances. So as soon as you identify the transactions to be affected, you're going to look at how is it going to affect what kind of a financial statement. And moving that one, then you need to make an, uh, the calculations for the amount involved in that adjustment. And then as soon as you're done with your adjustment, you're going to record it as part of your necessary adjustment. And then you ensure that the new balance are actually correct after making that recording. Right, so the number two, we've got the short-term adjustment where you have to apportion your income and expenditure received or paid in relation to the earlier or the later period. And the second one, we've got the prepaid expenses is the expenses that are actually paid in the current period, but for the future period. Usually we see that under the insurance. Normally they paid for the current period. Let's say your current period is actually 12 months but they can actually pay that for let's say 14 months or 13 months ongoing right looking at the examples that are made under your prepaid expenses it says or it goes as follows put a limited paid an amount of 7000 rand on the 1st of january 2021 for the insurance to the nine of financials and the monthly insurance amount to 500 rand the year end is actually the 31st of december so when you look at this it says that we've got a 12 months period. So what you're going to do in terms of the adjustment on that one, you're just going to say the monthly installment, you'd say 500 rent, and then you multiply that by 12, simply because our year, our year period is actually 12 months period. It gives us an amount of 6,000 rent, which represent the current year insurance under your profit and loss, and uh, the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income. So when, you, when you're dealing with this, usually you just say 500 rent, you multiply that by your 12 months, it will give you the exact amount under the current period, which is from the 1st of January 2001 up until the 1st of December. But the bigger question is, what are we going to do with the difference? Because uh, Puti or I paid 7,000 rent, which is actually more, meaning that the chances are I paid for 14 months because the monthly installment is 500 rand. Let's look on how do they work on that one. All right, in order to, rec to record the correct or the exact amount, you're going to say 7,000 minus 6,000 rent. The 6,000 rent is actually what is liable for the current period of 2021, and 7,000 is what I have paid initially at the beginning of the period. The difference is 1,000 rent, which is going to represent the prepayments of the insurance under the statement of financial position. That's your balance sheet as a short term portion under your current assets. So what you do is you open or you framework your statement of financial position, and then under the current assets, you're going to say short term portion of non current assets, or you can just uh, write it as the prepayments of the insurance, or you can add it with your, uh, what do you call it? Cash and cash equivalents of the bank. And then we include that amount of money is going to be their 1000 rand. Right, so basically that's what you do with regards to the prepayments. So this is what is going to uh, what is going to happen, meaning that when we move on to the 1st of January 2022, already the insurance is actually paid for the two months. Let's say Putty Limited say, guys, I'm no longer happy with you. I'm going to move on to insurance. So it means that you are going to be liable to pay Putty Limited 1000 rand back. It's no longer your money. Am I making sense? We need clarity on that. Do you want me to reiterate on that or are you fine? Please ask if you're not fine. Because I know this uh, can cause a bit of a trouble to students. If you're not happy about it, I can explain it again. Who is not happy? Please explain it again. Are we all happy? Are we all happy? Uh, I'm going to start all over. Prepaid expenses are the expenses paid in the current period for future financial period. Meaning that, uh, let's say our financial period is 2022, starting from the 1st of January 2022, 
up until the 31st of December 2023. That's a full 12 months period. In the examples, um, I said that I paid an amount of uh, 7,000 rand on the 1st of January 2021. And that's for the insurance. And we pay our insurance towards the demand of financials. Our monthly insurance is 500 rand. And the year end, as I've explained, is the 31st of December 2021 or 2022. That's a 12 month period. So what's going to happen is you're going to take the monthly installment, 500 rand, and then you multiply that by 12 just to show you how much is the exact amount that we're paying for the insurance. However, we've realized that a yearly installment for the insurance is 6,000 rand, which is 500 rand multiplied by 12, right? Meaning that we have overpaid that with 1,000 rand because we're supposed to pay 6,000 rand, but we ended up paying 7,000 rand. All right, when you do your statement of profit and loss, which is your income statement, the recorded relevant figure is 6,000 rand. So meaning that you're going to say under your expenses, you'll just say insurance, and then you say 5,000 multiplied by 12, your total figure will be 6,000 rand. That's under your statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income. However, since well, we have overpaid, we're not gonna ignore that. We still need to actually record that. In terms of the standard, we are obliged to record whatever that we have overpaid or whatever that we have underpaid. So we came to a recognition or the realization that we have paid over by 1,000 rand. And what do we do? We record that, this is by the standards. We record that under the statement of financial position, that is your balance sheet. And then under your current assets, you're going to put a line item that says prepayments or short term portion under your current assets. And then the amount will be 1,000 rand. So that if you add 6,000 rand with 1,000 rand, it means that you're going to have a total of 7,000 rand. So why are we doing that? We actually have paid more, and then we need to know on how many months are we left to pay in the next financial period. That's going to be your 2022, meaning that we're going to have 1,000 rand or 500 rand until by 10, okay? So the idea here is not to get the exact amount. The idea here is to get the principal. I hope Christelle is fine. Let me just go get back to you and Jay if you are. Christelle, are you fine? Can you come back, Christelle? Yes, I'm fine. All right. I wasn't asking for myself. Someone else wanted you to repeat, and it's like you couldn't hear the person. Oh, I'm not sure who, who, who that person was, but I hope that person heard what I just said because I'm going to move on now. But let's move on to the next item, which is uh, your accrued expenses. So that's an expense relating to the current financial period, but unpaid at the end of the year, meaning that it's actually not paid full year. So you can look at this one and say that it relates exactly as the opposite of the prepayments. Prepayments, you overpay, and the accrued, that means that you are behind with your payment. Let's have a look at the example here. So the example says that it was established that Telcom showed an expense with an amount of 2750 at the end of the financial period, at the end of the 31st of December 2001. So but the closer examination proved that the December payment did actually not take place. So this is what happens. Um, sorry about that. This is what happens. So you're going to say, okay, 2750,000 rent divided by 12 because, so divided by 11, simply because we don't, we need to determine how much is the monthly installment and the amount that will be fitting in the last monthly installment of the current financial period. So when you say 2,500 rand divided by 11 months, it's because we only paid for 11 months. So it will give you a monthly installment of 250, but, or however, for December, you're only accrued with an amount of 250. For the whole month, which is 11, you have paid that, okay? So when we close our books at the end of the financial period, so we have realized that 250 for December is actually outstanding, which is due, and that's actually your liability, all right? So what you're gonna do is, you need to record that under your statement of financial position under the current liability as accrued expenses. Right, so 3,000 rand will represent the income and the liabilities for the profit and loss account. 
makes sense. So you just say 2,750 plus 250 rents, and then you add them together, and then we're going to make an amount of 3,000 rents. Everybody happy? Um, I can't see the screen, but if you're not happy, please, you can go ahead. I'll just pause and uh, listen to your question. Everybody happy? Are we all happy? Right, let me, let's move on to the next um, item, consumable inventory. That's your trading stock. All right, it, relay, it relays the inventory left at the end of the year. But this is what happens. Uh, let's say Woolworths, for example. They've got the stock. They got, they've got a system where they record the stock for whatever the period it might be. Let's assume that they do their they do their books at each and every month. Okay, so they buy the stock for the whole month, and then they're going to see as they're going to see for how much do they purchase the stock for, and then how much of the stock that they purchased has been sold. Out of what has been sold, how much is left? I hope that makes sense. So whatever the stock that has been left, which is you're going to be the inventory at the end of the period. Is going to be recorded under your statement of financial position as a current account underlined inventory. All right. Uh, an example here it says that Putin limited purchased inventory of 4,000 rand during the year, and it was found that when they're doing the physical count, inventory to the value of 1,000 rand is still on hand, meaning that out of the 4,000 worth of the stock we purchased during that period, 1,000 rand worth of the stock is actually left. That's going to be a year end or a year period, a year period end uh, stock that is actually left in here. Let's look at how the recording goes by. So you're going to record inventory with an amount of 3,000 rent under the income and expenditure account. You remember uh, what's going to happen is you're going to have, you remember when you calculate the cost of sales, you're going to have opening inventory, you're going to have closing inventory, meaning that you're going to have inventory of 4,000 rent as a plus. And then you're going to have inventory of 3,000 rent as the sold one. And then you're going to take 4,000 minus 3,000 rent. That means the 1,000 inventory represent the inventory that is left at the end of the period. And then what we do with the 1,000 rent, we're going to record that under the asset section in your statement of financial position. So statement of financial position, you're going to have what's called the current assets. And underneath your current assets, you're going to write inventory uh, the inventory that has been left is going to be 1,000 rand. Right, the next one is the income received in advance. When you receive an income in advance, it means that you haven't rendered service for that income that you have received. So whoever that gave you the income in advance can say, I'm no longer doing any business with you. Pay me back whatever that you owe me money. Then that raise was called a liability under the statement of financial position. So it is defined as the income that relates to, or it relates to the income received in the current financial, which relates to the future period. Can you see on how prepayment and the income that has been received in advance, how it work? It goes exactly the opposite of each other. Prepayments, you pay, and then the income received in advance, you receive when in advance. So the prepayment goes to your assets and the income received in advance, it actually relates to your current liability. That's fine. Let me have a look at the closer example. It says that Putin limited rent two hectares of land to the Bombo farms for 16,000 rand a month. And upon closer investigation, it was revealed that at year end December 2021, rentals with an adjusted rentals with an adjusted 15% increase for January to March 2022 has been received in advance. So if you guys actually do understand uh, what I'm explaining to you, can somebody just help me to record this? I'm just doing this. Okay. You go to the screen. Who wants to help me with this one? I just want to make sure that you guys are actually going with me on the same page. Thank you, Craig. Um, I'm going to say that for January, February, and March 2022, uh, times 16,000 a month for the three months will be 48,000. So, okay, 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 sorry, sorry, so wait, wait, Craig. Uh, thank you for that. I'm just going to write whatever that you were telling me down. 
Come again. Okay, for January, February, and March, we've January, paid. February, January, February, and March. Is it for which year? For 2021. 2020. Okay, great. It's 2021. Uh, January. To February and March. We paid 16,000 Rand per month in advance. Amen. I just want to write it down. 16,000 Rand multiplied by? Three months. Times three months. Okay, I think it will be 48,000, I think. 48,000. Okay, let's not worry about figure. Let's worry about the principle. It's fine. 48,000. So <clears throat> if we say. 16,000 times 12 months. I'm not sure what that gives us. I don't have a calculator with me. If somebody okay. can. So if we say 16,000 times 12 months. All right, now I'm going to help you with a calculator just a moment. Just a moment, quick. Uh, Sixteen. Is that 16,000 times 12 months? Yes. Okay, for which year is that? Is it the same year? For the same year, for 2021. Right, right. 16,000 multiplied by 12. Uh, just a moment. 12. Okay, it gave me 192. 192. So, so 192,000, because that is the rental for the year, minus 48,000. Okay, so it's going to be 192,000 minus 48,000. 48,000. If somebody can help us with the calculation. I'll help you quickly. It's fine. Don't worry. Uh, 190, 192 minus 48. I've got 144. 144,000. Sorry. 144, so now I think we're going to have to do the first and adjustment entry for 2021. All right. For December 31st, 2021. Okay, can I say December 31st, 2021 adjustments, right? Okay, but before we do that, we'll have to say 144,000 divided by 12. Okay, it's so 144, 1, 2, 3 divided by 12. Okay, let me help you quickly with a calculator. One forty four, one two three, divided by twelve. I've got twelve thousand rents. Okay. So I'm not sure if I'm going the right way here, but if we do the adjustment entry for thirty first of December, we'll debit the rental income. You say debit, okay, just a moment. Debit rental income. income. And we yes. credit income received in advance and credit income how much is the rental income Great. um will be 12000 12000 then how and much income, is, the, is the is the advance income uh for the adjustment entry it'll also be 12000 we'll credit 12000 okay so uh, to my understanding, this will be your PL transaction, right? Yes. PL transaction, uh, OCI, and this will be your statement of uh, financial position. Yes. All right. So that's how you end things. Um, we still have to do a closing transfer okay. for the end for the 31st of December. Closing transfer. Closing transfer, yes. We'll say we'll debit red rental income. Rental, okay, we're going to. So is the closing transfer for which which year? For December 31st, for December 2021. 2021. All right, we'll just say 2021, yes. So you said we debit what? Rental? Rent income. Rental income. And I think we'll. How much? Um, I'll tell you now, 144,000. 144,000. 
and we'll credit the profit and loss account credit. for the same amount. Credit profit and loss account. Same amount, you say. Shall we go ahead? Yeah, so then we'll have to do the general ledger accounts. OK, the ledger account. Uh, first ledger account will be for rental income. Rental income, debit or credit? Uh, we'll debit income received in advance. Um, received. Will be 12,000. Okay. And profit or loss account. Profit and loss. Under the debit also will be 144,000. So is it debit or credit? Debit also. Forty-four. Yeah. I think I forgot what you say. It's a debit, right? Yes. Also, the profits and profit and loss account will be debited. <clears throat> and then under the same account, the rental income will yeah. will credit. Credit. I think our balance there. Uh, was, is it rental income, right? Uh, no, it should just say balance if I'm not. Well, it could say rent the income. Okay, it should. It'll be 48,000. OK, should I go by the balance of the rental income? Uh, 48,000. Okay. I'll but say balance. Or balance. 48,000. Eight thousand. Forty-eight thousand. Yes. Forty-eight thousand. Okay. So we go further. Uh, the income, the next ledger account, general ledger account, will be income received in advance. Okay. Income received in advance. We'll say on the credit side, we'll credit rental income with twelve thousand. Let's put my. You said credit, right? Yes. What? The next general ledger account will be profit or loss account. Debit or credit? It'll be a credit. Credit. And just thinking now. Okay. Um, it'll be 12,000. 12 grand. And that'll be the ledger accounts. Okay. All right. And are we, are we done? With the statement of financial position, we'll just uh, under the current liabilities. Right. We'll just. We just say SFP liabilities. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, it'll just show under the current liabilities, income received in advance is 48,000. Yes. Okay. okay are, we, are we are you done quick? Yeah, I think I'm done. Okay. Thank you so much for this for this work. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just gonna start at, at the beginning where you, you did your thanks. All right. Uh, you said in twenty twenty one from January to March. We had 16,000 rent multiplied by three, meaning that the rent has been paid for only three months. So is it for the rent for three months? Yes, rental uh, uh, rental received in advance. Oh, OK, this is for the rental received in advance. Let me just do this. When you draw,
Open John C in advance for January and uh, for January to March. Okay. Okay, Greg, I'm just going to bring you into the picture now. Um, why did you say the advance payment in the current year has been paid for three months? Okay, if we if we look at the 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 example, yes, they say we are renting land out to La Bombo Farms. Yeah. We charge them 16,000 a rent a month, and we've paid them for January to March. Yes. Or they've paid already. We've received the money already in advance yes. for January, February, and March. Yes. Okay. Um, I would agree with you if you said in 2022. 2022. Yeah, I see it now. 2020, yeah. 2022. However, there's still a bit of a shortage in your in your calculations. All right. If we can look at the thing is line number three, starting from the 31st of December, it says rentals with an adjusted increase of 15% for January to March 2023 has already been received. Okay. So it means that these people they paid 16,000 rent for three months in advance with an adjusted amount of 15%. Okay. So basically what you have to do is you say 16,000 multiplied by 15%, okay? So it should give you an amount of, I'll be with you just now, 16,000 multiplied by 15 divided by 100, which is 2,400 rand. So what you're going to do is 2,400 plus 16,000 rand then you multiply this by three. Then it should give you an amount of 55,200 rand. So you see on how do they treat you? Yeah. You were actually right, but you just forgot to put in the 15%. Yeah. Right? So it gives you, I think it's 2,400 rand. And then you're going to say plus, uh, where's the plus here? Plus 1,000 rand. Multiply by three months. Okay. An amount of 55,200 rand. This is how you adjust your rental received in advance. Okay. Makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. So, yes, the rental received in advance is an amount of 55,600 rand. But we are going to look at the current. Yeah, rentals. Uh, let me just see on how much did your current your rentals give you. I think you've got 192, which is quite correct. 192,000 rent in the current year. Right. So it means that the rental payment or the rental received, that an income should be an amount of 192,000 rent. Okay. That, so meaning that uh, under the incomes, you are going to have the rental when you do your statement of, let me just show you something, uh, p &L account, OCI. This is where it goes to your income statement, 192,000 rand. That's your income for the whole year that you have received, purely so. That doesn't require 15% adjustment simply because the increase came along at the beginning of 2022. Okay, so but this one, um, I'm not going to go into details in, in regards to the whole set of the ledger accounts and stuff like that. We'll see that when we do the questions on Saturday. Okay, I'll detail that down. Uh, now I just need to show you the basics in terms of the financial statements. So 55,200 rand, it will go under your statement of financial position as current, uh, current liability. S income received advance. When you do the comprehensive questions over the weekend. Thank you, sir. So this is my solution. I did that. One ninety two. I'm glad you got your current year rental income. And still, you got your 16,000 multiplied by three to be 48,000 or 44,000 rand 
It says that you forgot to adjust the 15% increase in the current year. But here it is now. Everybody happy? All right, sure. Let's look at our accrued income, which relates to the income in the current financial period, but not yet received. So we can see that this is quite an opposite of the accrued expenses. So the expense, uh, the example goes, it went as follows. It says that on the 31st of December, 2000, okay, my apologies for that. I think I didn't ask everybody if they do understand because I think Craig could be the one who does understand it much more better. Everybody, do you do, were you on the same pay, page with Craig or me? Welcome. Oh, it's your husband account. Yeah. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, a big pardon? No, I'm saying I understand. Okay, no problem. So everybody does understand. Do you guys understand? Yes, sir. Can yes. I move on? Yes. All right, cool. So the accrued income, it relates to the income is in the in the current financial period that I not yet received. And the examples is actually as follows. On the 31st of December 2021, the rental income showed an amount of 1,800 rent, and it was closely found out that 200 rent of the rental was not yet received. The recording will be as follows. 2,000 rent represent the income and expenditure account, and 200 rent would represent the trade and other receivables control account. So that means one of the data is actually going to be recognized here because the 200 rand is actually outstanding. So that's when you, you actually start to understand the ways like the doubtful debts or the credit losses and stuff like that. So you will see that when we do the T accounts under the trade and other receivables control account. Right, credit losses. So this relates to the clients who does not keep up with the payment agreement with their provider, credit provider. So you go to Woolworths or you go to Markham's, they open up an account with you. The credit manager did a do approve set and then they give you your payment schedule. They tell you you're going to pay there. They give you, let's say, credit amount of about 4,000 rent. You go there, you buy your clothes and now they're going to initiate what's called an installment for you on a monthly basis. So when you go there, when you make a payment on a monthly basis, they would say you like, okay, 300 grand, it, it will be good. It will be okay for what you've taken out of our shelves. So as time goes by, maybe you're failing to pay your installment. So initially you will become what's called doubtful because you jump one or two months. And if you jump, that will be, that will depend upon the company policy. If you, let's say, when you skip one or two to three months payment, then you become doubtful. And then when you skip for ongoing forwards, then you become a bad dad, meaning that they're going to put you under their books as a credit loss, all right? So it's going to reach a state where they would say your account has been handed over to the legal department, legal with this attorneys that are handling your account and they'll be able to bother with your SMSs with the calls and all of those to make some payment arrangements. So that's how the, pro, the whole process with the credit losses process starts. So my example went as follows. Hey, I think I've lost you now again. Okay, well, we are back now. Sorry, uh, I think the network is gone again. But as I was saying that, let's have a look at my example. So a notification has been received that Mr. Leo put a limited line has been liquidated and he owes an amount of 3,000 rand. An amount of 3,000 rand must be removed from Mr. Leo's account. Okay, when the amount has been received, removed from your account as a client, it means that you're going to be written off. What? That's why you've got credit loss written off me that they're going to hand your account to whatever they, uh, the attendees they are contracted to, that companies. Right, so the recording part will be like the total outstanding debt, which is the trade and other receivable. 
Right, the total outstanding amount of the trade and other receivables would uh, be reduced with an amount of 3,000 rand for Mr. Leo, because Mr. Leo has been written off as a recoverable debt. So as you all know that when the company establish a list of debtors, uh, what they do is they come, they're going to consolidate all of their figure or outstanding amount, and they're going to form one figure, which is going to be our opening balance and now the trade and other receivable balance. And simply because an asset is going to be on the debit side with that figure. So when you reduce a debt always doubtful or written off, meaning that you're going to go to the credit side of the T account with that amount and say, Mr. Leo, bad debt written off, then it's going to be minus and that's when you hand it over to the attendance. So your current asset section would be reduced with an amount of 3,000 rent specifically under your trade and other receivable cost control account. That's your debtors. So the credit loss amount will increase with an amount of 3,000 rent being an income and expenditure. <laughs> right, so when it's written off, it means that it's going to be out of your uh, trade and other, sorry, statement of provident loss with that, that amount, and then it's going, it's going to be held out independently. Sorry, what? Right. I don't Can you think hear me? it's just me. I can't see the screen. You can't see the screen. Okay. All right, let me just try to reopen the screen again. Can you see now? Yes, yes, Mr. Miso. All right, no, that's fine. Thank you so much. But right, let's have a look at the long term adjustments. So, long term adjustment include items like depreciation. So it says that when an entity buys a tangible large asset to produce an income, they are due to for depreciation on a yearly basis as they are utilized. You can all remember that I told you that the company is the company responsibility to say, we use the straight line method in terms of the depreciation for the asset in use for production purposes, or you're using the reducing balance or using the production unit method. So as years go by, Obviously, that asset will no longer be productive as it used to be as it was new. So the process won't be the same as well. So it says that they are spread over the expected useful life hence because of the depreciation part. I gave you an example, which is an easy one here, because oh. I just want to welcome you. I think, hello, somebody talking? Hello? Am I losing you guys? No, sir, you can continue, why? Okay. No, I had, I thought like somebody was actually talking. Thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Right, examples is actually as follows. Putin limited purchased a vehicle worth 200,000 rands at the 31st of December, and the 40,000 rand must be written off as a depreciation. Let's look at the recording part. 40,000 rand depreciation represent the depreciation as an income and expenditure account or the provident loss and other comprehensive income. And 160,000 rand is going to be representing the carrying amount to be transferred to the statement of financial position under the line item called property, plant and equipment. That's your PPE. So you, you know that the depreciation in the previous year becomes the accumulated depreciation in the current year. And the standard further says that the cost, which is 200 rent minus the accumulated depreciation or the depreciation of 40,000 rent, gives us the carrying amount of the book value of 160,000 rent. So this is going to be an amount at the end of the financial period that is left for, or that was the value of the car. We're going to transfer that money under the statement of financial position as carrying amount at the end of the financial period with an amount of I think I'm, yeah, 160, just a moment, 200,000 rand minus 40,000, yes. I beg your pardon, 200,000 rand minus 40,000 rand is 160,000. That's going to be a new carrying value. And it's, it is always important to emphasize that the contract allocation account for the depreciation would be the accumulated depreciation. Like I said, the depreciation in the previous accounting period in the current year is going to become our deep account accumulated depreciation. 
I hope you guys can see that. It says that is the closing of procedure, which is determining the profit of an entity and the preparations of the financial statement. But I'm just going to take you through the theory and then we'll do all those channels uh, on, on Saturday. Closing of procedure and then we also determine what's called the profit of an entity and then obviously we're going to prepare the financial statements. Why? So it says they're determining uh, the gross profit. So you need to determine the gross profit. Sometimes they can say you determine what's called the trading account. You know that sales minus the cost of sales, it can also be performed via the trading account, but sales minus cost of sales is actually gross profit, right? Sometimes the sales need to be adjusted by itself, then it's going to be the sales, and then when you've got the returns. You remember guys, when we've got the sales here now and the sales returns here, this is exactly what I'm explaining now in theory. Sales minus sales returns is equal to the net sales. And then the profit for the year is derived from the income minus the expenses and finance cost, which can also be performed by the profit and loss statement as a T account. What? So you can also get your profit under the trading account T account. Uh, you can also get your gross profit via the trading account, which you're going to have sales on the credit side and the cost of sales on the debit side. And then it's going to give you the gross profit is going to give you the gross loss. Okay, depending on which one is actually greater than which one. Well, the next line item will be the inventory systems. Uh, realize that in most of your questions, they like this. So it's either they give you the perpetual inventory system, which is quite continuous, or they give you the periodic inventory system. So under the perpetual inventory system, the inventory is purchased is recorded under the inventory account at the cost price and the inventory sold will be transferred from the inventory account to the cost of sales. So meaning that you need to determine the cost of sales under the perpetual inventory system. So depending on how the inventory is sold or purchased, so you need to go to your page one one of the guide. Do not go by my guide because I'm using the old guide. Maybe it's in a different page on your new study guide. So the periodic inventory system, the inventory purchase is recorded under the purchases account. Meaning, okay, on the first one, which is the perpetual one, it means that you need to open the inventory account or the cost of sales account. And the second one, which is the periodic inventory system, if you're using this system or the method, it means that you're going to have what's called the purchases account instead of the inventory account. Cost of sales is determined at the end of the financial period. It will also depend on how the inventory is sold or purchased. So please look at your theory in your study guide there. Right, determining the cost of sales. Remember, when you do your cost of sales, you've got your opening inventory, you've got your carriage on purchases, you've got your railage, you've got your source customs and exercise duty for inspection. But at the end of the day, you're going to minus your closing inventory in order for you to get the cost of sales. So look at the drawings and donations. Not quite often you get this in the exam, but it's important to know it because one or two questions might have it. Inventory taken for inventory taken for personal use under the perpetual inventory system is recorded by debiting drawings, and then you credit the inventory in question. What and the inventory taken for personal use under the periodic inventory system is recorded by debiting drawings, and then you credit purchases. So you can see the difference in between the two under the same under the difference method. Perpetual inventory system, you credit the inventory, and the personal and the periodic inventory system you credit the purchases. So drawings will always be there, debit part. Donations of the inventory under the perpetual inventory system is recorded by debiting the donation and crediting inventory, while under the uh, periodic inventory system are recorded by donation and credit the purchases. So the key issue here, the key factor here is the inventory along with your purchases. So the account in question is always recorded in the same way despite which method you're using. But the contract allocation account is where it changes depending on which method are you using. Let's close of our nominal accounts. De determination of these would be the closing journals and transferring the amounts to the trading accounts or profit and loss accounts. Basically, and then you prepare your own financial statements for that fact. Trading accounts is used to determine the gross profit of the loss. I've told you that's when you need your sales or your cost of sales. So trading accounts as opposed to the profit and loss account, OCI, trading account is actually performed by a T account. And the profit and loss statements is used to determine the net profit at the end of the financial period. 
So this comes to the end of our journey for me and I, my friend.